Hey, there we go. Now we're now we're cooking. Okay. All right, so I have um, on my screen process, the book club title page. Do you guys see that? Mm -hmm. And then we should be on the side here or something like that. Let me just pull up my notes so I can sound intelligent. All right, so let's let's quickly get some names just in case we need them going around the room. So Ruben, why don't you quick introduce uh, who you are, um, your business name, and the number of employees and what you focus on equipment versus event. Sure. My name is Ruben Ayub. I'm a owner of TLC Rents in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we've been in business for about 25 years or so, and uh, we have about 23 full-time employees year round. And then, uh, and we focus 100% on party. Awesome. Okay. North of the border, Mr. Infinite, let's get, get your take. Yeah, Sheldon Fingler here with Infinite Event Services out of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, we are 100% party and event company as well. And and Ruben Sheldon was able to come down to Meeting of the Minds. So we met him down in uh, in Arizona last week or two weeks ago, I guess. Cool. It was good. Okay. All right. So first off, um, thanks for coming. This is our fourth uh, book club. And I want to quickly recap, um, inside peer groups, we try to remind everybody that we have quarterly disciplines. And so the first quarter, we try to focus on strategy. That's going to pick up again this January 1st. And we covered the book traction in the book club in the first quarter. Second quarter came and we got involved with cash and we were able to cover the book profit first, which I am continuing to try to implement in my company. Not the easiest thing. Traction is easy compared to profit first. Um, a third quarter came and we we're talking about people. And my favorite book of the year was How to Be a Great Boss. And Charlie will vouch for you that I've done a phenomenal job. Uh, you took all the bullet points and implemented them 100%. Yes, yes. <laughs> very, very, my employees love it. Okay. And then uh, obviously we're in the fourth quarter and now we're doing execution. And um, execution leads us to getting it done, and we got to do it through some processes. This book was released in the fourth quarter, so that's cool. It's brand brand new, great book, uh, very small book, so very easy to read. I'll probably have to read it a number of times to really get it, but um, I hope you appreciate the book club. This was a new idea that came out of our customer council, and we continue to have customer councils with our members to feed us ideas that you guys would be interested in. So hopefully that was a success this year. Now, outline for these two sessions. We are going to have a second session. Uh, Charlie, when's a date on that? December 8th or something? Yeah, I'll have to look uh, at yeah, it. Yeah, sometime in December. <laughs> so there are really three sections to the book. The first section focuses on committing. Second section focuses on learning. And the third section focuses on acting, okay? <clears throat> so it's important to know that uh, we only have two sessions and we're covering three topics. So we're gonna just touch on uh, commit and learn today. We will probably um, just barely touch learn and we'll be focusing on learning and then acting in the um, second session, which is gonna take place in December. Hey, Beth. December 8th. December 8th. Hi, Beth. How are you? Good. How is everybody? Good. We just right. uh, we Go just ahead. went around the horn. So why don't you just take a minute and well, all we need is your name, rank, and serial number. Um, <laughs> you know, how many employees you might have and whether your equipment or event. So hi, I am Beth Hoff Blackmer with Aspen Rental in Western Colorado, and I am an equipment rental um and i have nine employees excellent appreciate that and we have um reuben and sheldon with you they are both event rental operators right reuben's down in georgia and sheldon's in north of the border yes i know sheldon i do All not right. know reuben nice to meet you excellent nice to meet you. so we're going to be going over section one and two of the book today and i'm going to jump right into it so number one commit 
So you get into the beginning of the book, just like any book written by an EOS author, EOS implementer author. Um, they talk about EOS at the front end, and so you're going to get a little of that in into your head. Um, uh, I'm assuming, did anybody here read, read the book? I think, Ruben, you might have read a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Okay. It's it's in my Audible to listen to next week when I head out to Arizona. Yes. There you go. Now, well, and again, like I say every time for book club, if you haven't read it, you don't need to now because you're going to get the best, you know, version of the book through the book club. So um, two big issues in chapter one of the book. We're going to talk about the right mindset, which I love the fact that every EOS book seems to focus on the owner first. So they really, you know, EOS is about getting things done through the whole workforce. But at the same time, it's got to be inside the owner's head that you're going to make some changes, right? Secondly, we're going to talk about why process is important. And that's a big part of today's session. So we'll learn a little bit about how, you know, we make, you know, make the ice cream, but at the same time, we're going to um, uh, really kind of understand why you want to spend the time to do it. So the right mindset. First off, love the quotes. This one is a good one. Uh, magic occurs when you blend a culture of discipline with the ethic of entrepreneurship. And that was Jim Collins. Jim Collins, I put this one in here because you're going to see quite a bit of Jim Collins throughout this book. He, even though he never really wrote a process book, good to great, really focused on what made companies great. And uh, it's a lot of it had to do with process and process innovation and things like that. Another one that was a great one was um, a dream doesn't become reality through magic. It takes sweat, determination, and hard work, right? So we turned around and we saw that we read four books this year and we did four book clubs and they were tied to the dif different disciplines in the business. That felt great, but that took a lot of work, right? We had to do the work to get there. We couldn't just say, hey, you know, I'm going to make this happen. It, it took all 360 days, right, to get it done, so... Um, that was Colin Paul who said that one. And uh, a couple of key points in the first chapter uh, that came through. And and Ruben, I'll definitely hit you up with a question here uh, if you have any you can throw in. But <clears throat> there was a theme that basically said undisciplined companies face inconsistent execution. And we found that to be the case inside peer groups. Uh, you know, we have 18 groups now. We're trying to be consistent. And if we are not disciplined, we will not be uh, consistent. So a peer group's member experience in one meeting might be different than a peer group member's experience in another if we are if we let that go unchecked, right? Something we need to focus on. Um, next piece is undisciplined companies ignore process. So we notice that as well. Like, um, if you don't have discipline in the company, you're probably not going to care too much about process itself. Um, and the question I have for you guys is why, why would, why would an undisciplined company ignore process? Why, why does anybody ignore process? It's just yeah. easier to do it the way you're doing it. Yep. What and else? taking the time, taking the time to set up the process, just because you get busy working in instead of on things. So we're definitely going to address that one. That's a good point, Beth. Anyone else? Any other ideas? I could tell I you that. Say, I would say, yeah, unclear process, perhaps not understood. Very good. Yes, Natalie. Thanks for joining us. Another one north of the border on the call. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So. Definitely all of the above, everything you said, but I would also argue that this is the number one reason, right? <laughs> Processes are boring. No one wants to look at process, document process. They're usually typically not urgent for you to kind of say, hey, let's let's get our let's roll up our sleeves and look at the process that we're we're focusing on right now. Let's try to get to make an improvement here. So being in the right mindset was one of the point. They took almost a whole chapter to get through and explain why we run into these, um, you know, these these brick walls when it comes to documenting your process. I can't tell you how many times I've told my peer group. I'm in two peer groups. I've told them I'm going to document this process, right? And I wasn't wasn't able to to do that. Um, okay. 
Uh, thank you for that, Charlie. So Charlie reminds us that the second session is going to take place on December 8th. So we'll this is being recorded, and then um, we'll also record the next one in case you can't make that. So later in the first chapter, I love they begin with the end in mind. And if I can get this thing to move. There we go. So this is the book. This is what the book's all about, right? So it's the process process. So they said, you know, sticking to the theme here, this is what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on your, your ability to commit and the commitment part uh, section of the book. Um, and then we're going to get into um, the next um, section, which looks at uh, a three-step process documenter where you can see here, we're going to identify um, what it is we want to document. We're going to then document, simplify it. Then we're going to package it. And there's a lot of um, theory around like, well, how do you go about documenting your processes? And we'll kind of get into that. Um, the other part to it is you'll use an FBA checklist and, you know, they'll step through this. FBA stands for, well, uh, we'll check it out later. I didn't I don't have it in front of me here. Uh <laughs> Hey, Charlie, look that one up too. I so will. Train, <laughs> train, measure, manage, and then update. So has um, Ruben's not all the way through the book, but once you get through the book, I'm, I'm going to assume that we're going to, you know, bite off one of your core processes and try to, to document or go through this process. What is, um, what would you say is a core, one of the core processes of, um, an event rental operation? Uh, the order prep process. Okay, good one. So say that again, it was the related to the? The order preparation. Order prep, order prep. okay, got it. So it starts at, starts at one side of the company and goes through fulfillment or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct, order fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so event rental has to deal with um, a lot of different moving parts related usually to an event, right? A specific event, no pun intended, uh, whereas rental uh, equipment rental might be different. What's a core process in the equipment rental side? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Core process on equipment rental? Um, turning stuff around to get it ready to go back yeah, out again. Yeah, I was just going to say the car ready to rent. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So you're going to have to check in um, equipment and then maintain the equipment, make sure it's ready to go. Right. And turn back around. So ready to rent could be a, uh, a key process you'd want to focus on. So <clears throat> those are good. So imagine applying this process to that process, right, to make an improvement there. That would be the first step. So next part of the chapter, they talked about three common causes of anti-process bias. Um, the first one was, then they call them myths. So we'll talk about it as a myth. Um, number one, process is not in my nature. Um, so what is, um, what, what do you think that means? Process is not in my nature. So this well, if you have, a, you have a grumbly guy at the front <laughs> counter who's not in his nature to be friendly in customer service. Got it. Okay, that's a good one. I was thinking more along the lines of the, the taking it back to EOS, the visionary is not the implementer. So you don't think of a visionary being a process oriented type person. They're more mm -hmm. abstract and looking um, more down the road and bigger picture type of things more than working sure. in it. Yep. And in general, um, you know, I would also argue that in general, entrepreneurs, right? So entrepreneurs are typically not people who say, oh my gosh, I love process. You know, I'm going to work on process. Um, but what you'll, what you'll find is that most entrepreneurs are naturally process oriented. When, in peer groups, when we go around and we visit each other's locations, um, you know, you'll see some great entrepreneurs who maybe you know, speak off the top of their head when they're in a peer group meeting, they don't take notes, they just are talking, but then you go to their establishment 
And they've established some really cool processes without actually calling them processes, right? So they're naturally process oriented. That's how they differentiate themselves in versus their competition. So that's number one myth. Another one is um, that process takes too much time. So, you know, every anybody have this come up in their own world? They feel like this is legit, like it takes too much time to to worry about processes or improving processes. Yes. Yeah, a couple people. And and I think, you know, John Wooten, John Wooden said, if you don't have time to do it right, when will you have time to do it over? And in the book, they go into detail about how the first meeting for his team each year, it, he'll use the whole meeting to go over how to properly put on your socks, right, in, in preparation for a game. Now, this is back in the day when they didn't have great sock technology, but blisters became an issue back in the day on these these games. We go on for a couple hours, and um, so he had committed – to making sure everybody on his teams uh, were putting on their socks properly, right? So it gives you an idea about the preparation that how important preparation is in, in his world. The last myth uh, that they cover is uh, we're going to get into a little bit more detail. Process destroys freedom. So why don't we talk about that for a second? What what do you think that means? Process destroys freedom. Doesn't allow people to creatively do get the job done. It yeah, takes right. away from flexibility. Yeah, if you take away their freedom, they might not innovate, right? They might not make a better mousetrap for you. They're stuck doing the regular thing. So there's a lot in this chapter about that. Um, well, the response on this is try not to think 100, 100, 100 but try to think 2080. And what that means is you don't have to document 100% of the steps, right? Um, and you don't have to document all the steps in all the processes to get 100% compliance, right? So I think that's the key is um, you wanna document the 20 that makes 80% of the impact. So let's go back one step to the original conversation about core processes, right? So the core process would probably make up 20%, right? Of, of how you might differentiate yourself. So you could take a smaller process in your company and document it, look at it, improve it, all those things that we covered earlier. Um, but it might not have the impact. So core processes would be the ones that would probably be the 20% that make about 80% of the impact. So part of what this is about with this book is to really kind of um, start the process of documenting your processes and understanding like from an outline standpoint, which of those processes have the biggest impact. And then let's work on those and identify um, what needs to uh, be improved in those processes. So, so that's a key element of that third myth. And just as follow up, they gave you some good quotes. This is the um, always famous, notorious Elon Musk and Jim Collins again popping up here. So Elon said, I don't believe in process. A lot of big companies, uh, at a lot of big companies, process becomes a substitute for thinking. You're encouraged to behave like a little gear in a complex machine. It allows you to keep people who aren't that smart and aren't that creative. And then Jim Collins also threw it down saying, the purpose of bureaucracy is to compensate for incompetence and lack of discipline. Most companies build the bureaucratic rules to manage the small percentage of wrong people on the bus, which in turn drives the right people away. So there's that whole get the right people on the bus, right? So um, that was those were concerns raised around process and focusing on process. Um, you may recall that uh, there was a quality improvement process that came out 30 years ago, um, really focusing on the cost of not having good processes, the cost of inconsistency. Um, and then uh, we went into process, uh, business process reengineering, where, again, you were focusing on uh, ways to uh, shorten up steps and, and eliminate, uh, minimize some checklists, right, that kind of thing. So these guys are kind of replying, responding to that. They're like, 
hey, we're entrepreneurial spirited people. We want our employees to be entrepreneurial and so forth, so on. So it it was a concern. Is anybody, are you guys buying what they're selling here? Or do you have any comment on any of these quotes? I would say it depends on what seat in the bus they're on, whether or not you want them to be creative or not. Okay. Anyone else have a takeaway on this slide? Hmm. Obviously some anti-process comments here. Hmm. So I like to look to um, other industries to see what they, how they feel about it. Brilliant minds, leaders in those industries. So had to look into Bruce Springsteen's view on this and uh, he gave us uh, some good feedback. He says, uh, getting an audience is hard. Sustaining an audience is hard. It demands a consistency of thought, of purpose, and of action over a long period of time, right? So obviously, he's buying into this idea of consistent thought, purpose, and action, right, over a long period of time. When, for those of you who joined at the beginning, you saw that this is our fourth book club. This is the fourth book that I read and got through this process and uh, again, that's four more than last year, right? So the, the idea is <laughs> it takes time. You have to be consistent, um, you know, and by the end, we have recorded, you know, webinars around book clubs that we're building up a library on. And, you know, by the time we're three years into it, we should have a pretty nice uh, group of thought leaders uh, information out there for people through these book clubs. Same thing with all of our programming and for you all it's the same thing when you deliver, right? So let's real briefly think about um, equipment rental first. We got Charlie and Beth on the line here. Uh, equipment rental, what would be a an example of uh, consistent activity that brings about a desired result for you guys? Contract writing process, just making sure we've got who's on the phone, what's the guy that's calling, who we're going to be delivering to the cell phone, the job name, the so we sort of have a five-step process that they have to go through for every single time. Nice. I, I set her up for that one. No, All right. <laughs> that was the perfect answer. Exactly. I mean, oh my gosh, yeah. Like the contract writing process, you're going to bring different people onto your counter at different points in time over your career, like and every rental operation is slightly different, right? We have uh, two vendor partners. One's called the Call Coach, and the other one is, um, uh, um, of course, I'm going to forget. Charlie, you should know the new the new guys that we started. Oh, uh, listen, listen, force. Yeah, yeah listen. Is force. that right? Yeah. So, good example. That actually, you know, came from American Rental Association. But um, again, what they're focusing on is consistent and purposeful, and being like very much having owner think when you're presenting and working with a prospective uh, buyer of your services, right? And then again, of course, working through a contract. Um, how about management software? Does that help you or hurt you when it comes to this type of thing? Oh, it totally helps you because it's going to create it repeatable every time. Yep. Yeah. So it, And so part of what people have done is they use training on the software as a way to teach its process to your employee, right? Oh, our process involves a lot of technology, right? So let's just follow the dotted line on that. What about on the event rental side when it comes to uh, getting ready for tent installation? Is that something that would benefit from something like process review and process documentation and things? Oh yeah, like a like an water pool, like a Tent checklist. <laughs> part, Correct. Part right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you think about how many times um, a company might send a second person with the driver or might, um, you know, have to turn around and go back because they missed something. It's mm -hmm. critical that they have check in lists and they also have lists for, you know, taking down tents, what happens at the end, how to go through the process of intake of. Um, the different event rental act stuff when it comes back, you know, whether it's silverware or linens or anything, you know, the processes around those, those are all core related to what you do in a business, right? So keep that in mind. Okay, let's go to uh, our next 
slide. So, so the point I guess that you're making in this bringing up these different sides was that neither one or the other viewpoint is actually totally true. It's the assumption that one has to be right and the other one has to be wrong. It's actually a false dichotomy. You, you, you don't have just two options. You have multiple options available, right? So that's what the takeaway is on that. Okay, back to Jim Collins. He had something else to say on the topic. I didn't want you guys to think of him as a bad guy. So <clears throat> he gets into um, establishing a culture of discipline. And so his quote was, disciplined people who engage in disciplined thought and take disciplined action operate with freedom, uh, operating with freedom within a framework of responsibilities. Uh, that is the cornerstone of a culture that creates greatness, right? So he um, he did a lot of work on Good to Great and his other books and focused on, you know, what sets apart a great company from a mediocre company or just a standard company. And um, he did use the phrase disciplined quite a bit, right? So um, in this case, he used discipline three times in the first sentence, right? So people thought and action. If there's discipline activity around all that, you're going to get a consistent result and you still can have flexibility, right? So we talk about this all the time. Like, do you need to document the system or do you create a framework around the system? Usually you start with the framework, right? Create the framework, provide the guardrails for your employee to interact. And, and then, um, you know, certainly at that point, there should be some freedom to change that. What other ways do you engage um, your employees on changing a process? How are they involved in this? Is it something where you just wake up and you put it down uh, on paper and give it to them? Or how are, you, how are employees engaged in a process? Well, we would build our processes from the ground up. So we would talk with our staff first to make sure because they're the ones a lot of times uh, on the front lines. So getting their input to build a process is important. That's great. Yeah, it's ab absolutely right. They'd be involved. Anybody who's implementing EOS or has a leadership team knows that a lot of it starts with the employees. They're giving you feedback on what they've seen out in in their day-to-day -day activity, their work life, and they're su making suggestions back to you to make a change in the existing process, right? So whether we document a process or not, these processes exist. It's how we do our work every day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you certainly have your um, financial controls and your reporting, and that's the back end and the reporting piece. Um, and you certainly um, might have some front end sales and marketing activity. And then you have the do in the middle, right? The the actual operations of the company. And and so that's where, you know, the minute that the day starts, you're they're working through it and they're going to uncover issues to be addressed, right? Yeah. So how about you, Beth? You've got guys I say the same thing. I mean we we, you know, we kind of definitely have like our inbound call the way we handle an inbound call or contracts but we're always saying to the you know especially counter people if there's something that works different for you um rich walker or excuse me um there's drew blank who's the big guy that worked with rich for years um and he's back looking for him anyway he charles he came up and gave us this really great spreadsheet for taking every detail of every call and that works great for like a minute for some of my guys and another, you know, some of my other people will still be using it years later because they like that that way. So I think it's just being able to, you know, it's still getting the essential five steps that we talked about put into the contract. But it the, it, you know, I so saw some of my folks, I give them the freedom to not have to do that as long as they're getting the steps handled and they've got the memory or whatever. Um but there is a notebook next to every counter that we make sure that people are writing down who's on the phone and what's the cell phone of the person on the phone. That's a requirement just because it always happens. We have to have to call them back if we don't have that number. Um, but yeah, so I think that operating freedom, but freedom, but you know, not necessarily the end result is the same, but we give everybody a little freedom in between. No, that's great. I mean, those are the guardrails, right? So you're telling them don't cross this line, but inside that you can get it done. And as long as they're, 
you know, checking the boxes on your critical pieces, anything else is a flourish, right? People don't want to be static or boring in their day-to-day activity. So that gives you the freedom to act. Does anybody know of any companies uh, that are customer facing that you feel like they've got this figured out? Chick-fil-A. Who's that? Book they gave. <laughs> Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. Yeah, Chick-fil-A. In the book they gave the example in and out burgers. Oh yeah, that's in the book. So we're going to address that one coming up here. On, I think I have it on one of the slides. So we'll save that story for a second. Get over here. Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts, my nemesis. So no, we had a peer group meeting in uh, Four Seasons this year that did not go as planned. Uh, and we hadn't been in a Four Seasons in a while. So I was a little disappointed that they weren't able to do what they are used to doing. But yeah, Four Seasons is usually, uh, you know, very predictable in what you receive and how you're treated. But then they have this exceptional element to them, which by the way, we did experience some exceptional service at the Four Seasons. I don't want to, you know, degrade them in any way. Um, We had a simple issue that we, you know, was with one individual there, but um, yeah. So systemizing the, this is from the owner, systemizing the predictable so you can humanize the exceptional. And I recommend you all steal that tag phrase for your company. (laughs) No one will know where it came from, except if they watch (laughs) this book club. But um, you know, it's, it's powerful. It's, it's uh, gosh, it's, it's a great way to present your company to employees as well as to customers. Right. So um, any thoughts on that? Anyone else have any examples of things like this they've seen other than in an outburger? Cause we're going to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Any outstanding uh, service you've received recently? Well, I mean, I think not that they're customer facing you speak to them, but Amazon. Yeah. And just the way they move stuff through and you get your stuff in two days. And I mean, it's not humanizing, but as far as making no, they're, it they're more becoming, exceptional than other yeah. any, other shipping venues. So, you know, I, I always thought it was curious how they were distributing the distribution right? So Amazon warehouses popping up everywhere, these mega warehouses everywhere. And everybody's like, oh, they're in my backyard. Oh, but it brings jobs. But man, it's, you know, a blemish on our neighborhood, blah, 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 whatever it is. Yeah. I will tell you, I I will tell you. I love it, but. Yeah. I was going to say, I actually, (laughs) um, I had a great response on that. You know, I'm a, I'm a, um, emotional buyer, right? I like, if I'm on a counter, I'm seeking, a specific type of candy that I have to have, right? Um, I don't usually buy candy, but if the candy's on the counter, I'm going to eat it, right? I'm going to grab it. And uh, be- that's what they do. They they look for emotional buyers. You see it in your social media now where that you're getting tagged for um, things. You just happen to click on and buy it right then just because you saw it. Um, I had that experience on uh, November 1st. Um, I got this email. I think it was, yeah, it had to be Amazon but it was like, oh, you, you read a lot of rock and roll books. And um, Bono just released it and Bob Dylan both put their books out today. So it was November 1st. <laughs> I remember it was before I got my coffee and I'm sitting looking at the um, the phone and it um, I you know just went ahead and clicked through and bought it with one click and they got delivered that day. So it was literally the same day delivery <laughs> they showed up. And I just thought, like, how cool is that? Like, I didn't have to go anywhere. It wasn't like, you know, it actually didn't go to a store at all. Just went right direct to their internet, you know, their warehouse thing. So an example of process innovation and how things are changing in society, right? Good for me. I got my stuff early. Of course, I didn't read either book yet. It's been (laughs) a month, almost a month. You're saving that for the book club for next year? Yeah, book club. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rock and roll. Yeah, we're, we're leaving business and we're going to rock and roll, <laughs> rock and roll yeah. for, for when 23. I, when I sell my business, that's all I'll do is rock and roll book clubs, <laughs> things like that. So we covered the right mindset pretty well. So now we're in the next part, uh, which is why process is important. Again, first couple of chapters of this book are critical uh, because they really get your um, juices flowing as to why you would commit and spend time doing process. Um, so why process is important. Briefly here, uh, process is a set of actions or operations that achieves a desired result. 
And the question is, what is a strong process component? So we're going to get into that. Um, from EOS perspective, we identify a handful of core processes. So if you're trying to implement EOS in your company, you'll get to this point where you'll say, you know, what is the core process that we're involved in and how do we go about documenting it, simplifying it and FBAing it? And FBA is followed, followed by, by all. all. Thank you. Yeah. Followed by all FBA. So process for sure. Here's the EOS model. You see vision, data, process. Well, vision, people, data are the top part. Um, and then issues and process and traction are the bottom part of the circle. And really each one of these blocks uh, or whatever you would call it is, has a, a, an optimized state. So, you know, if you've fully worked through your people issues, you have, you know, created a place that recruits and retains the best employees who are outstanding performers, right? <clears throat> Same thing goes with any of these things. You're going to optimize in each of these pieces of the EOS model. Um, another thing that you're seeing here is when you start to document, it becomes almost like franchisable, right? Oh, we've created standard operating procedures. This is how we do things. Um, this is a, a proprietary way of doing business that successfully and preferentially differentiates every extraordinary business from one of its competitors. So you're really looking at it and saying, how do we do things different from others? Um, and, you know, Charlie and I were talking about this earlier today about like, you can go down to Louisiana and visit bottom line equipment. And, you know, it's unclear that they've documented every process. I know they have just because I knew that from behind the scenes, but when you have, um, you know, 140 million of rental going through multiple locations, you know, how are they, how those, when you see those businesses, you see how different they are from like Sunbelt, you go visit a Sunbelt or you go inside a United rental. And again, it's a different model. I totally get it, but they have somehow found a way to have these um, processes um, implemented and docu across all their operations. Right. So that's, that's kind of the franchise prototype. This is identified inside the book, The E-Myth Revisited. This book uh, came to me prior to the book Scaling Up, um, which then be begat traction, right? So if you're going to go back to the origin, uh, probably the E-Myth Revisited would be the place to start. Some great stuff in that book that is not covered in traction or scaling up. So I highly rec recommend it. little side note, um, I had to hire Michael Gerber to speak one time and he met me in Estes Park and it was just really cool. He, you know, he was really committed to giving me a whole bunch of signed copies of the book and we would give them out to our customers inside of our network. At the time I was doing the automotive network versus rental network. And um, it was a lot of fun, but uh, <laughs> you know, out of the minds of geniuses, right? Like, so this guy, it was, a pot smoker hung out like a hippie in the seventies and just really became passionate about process improvement. And so E-Myth uh, became kind of his uh, cornerstone book. And um, it was great to meet him in person. But the reason why I bring that up was uh, he insisted on not wearing pants the whole time I was with him. So it was very off-putting. I couldn't, uh, <laughs> he, he, he's one of those guys that goes to his hotel room, takes his pants off right away. And then he's walking around in a, in a long shirt. So I thought that was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> didn't, didn't, don't really have anything else to say about that, but I thought that was <laughs> interesting. They covered him in the second chapter of the book. <laughs> so, um, going to our next reference inside this chapter was, um, in and out burger. So, uh, Ruben, I had a young, pup with me out in Arizona. Um, and he's like, no matter what happens on this trip, I'm glad to be here and work with you, but I need to get to In-N-Out Burger because I've, you know, I've heard great things. I want to do it. Now, <clears throat> we all have opinions about the quality of the food. Um, but in, do you remember the story at all in the, in the book? Mm -hmm. So strong vision plus yeah. strong process, right? Mm -hmm. So I think this was, uh, interesting in that 
it was uh, pretty telling to me that you can't have one without the other. I, I felt like the more I start looking at businesses that get cited for being innovative and creative and then being very like rhythmic in what they're doing, I um, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, like, but they've all had really strong visionaries on what they're looking to do. So they had a picture in their head. So same with you guys. So, you know, there's a reason why we cover strategy first whenever we're working with a client um, is to really understand the vision of where you're headed and making that a priority. And then the processes will follow that, right? So if your goal is to have 15 locations, uh, there's a reason why you might be, you know, with one location, documenting one location. Um, if your plan is to have one location, you might be looking at it differently, right? So <coughs> any comments on in and out Burger? Any no, comments? Yeah. Nope. I've, even eaten I've never one been there, but they said, uh, I mean, it was interesting. They, they, how they family owned business. They've, uh, followed their vision and everything they do ever since from the very beginning and still do it today, which I thought was pretty interesting. <clears throat> I don't remember how long they've been there, but, uh, but just things like they, they never open a store less than like 300 miles from a distribution center or something like that. Just, yeah. Yeah. Very well thought out. So, strategy. so my thought on that story, it was a couple pages and, and it, that was my, comment was well thought out like almost like the business didn't exist and they were still documenting and preparing as if the business was going to is, exist so when you guys want to go somewhere with your business um you know especially if you're implementing eos you should be making those types of opportunities part of your issues list to then be worked through on your l10 like Hey, are we going to do this or not? And um, I work with one particular company. I found them relocate their second store, open a third store, and now open a fourth store in a four-year time frame. And I work with this owner um, for 20 years now. But the last four years, while he's at his oldest state, right, because you age every year, he's more innovative than ever. <clears throat> and it's because of what he's doing with EOS. So they got to that process point and exactly, you know, in and out burger reminds me of that rental company. So keep that in mind. So uh, we have two pieces left and then I will let you go until next time. Um, we're going to talk about the benefits of having a strong process <clears throat> and my voice is going to wear out. And then also we're going to look at the costs of having a weak process. So um, number one, um, you'll grow faster and more sustainably. So that kind of addresses, you know, this guy opening up a fourth store um, just because he can, right? It's I've been doing his quarterlies for three years now. So um, any any other comments around that? Do you guys see what's happening out in the marketplace with rental? Are their companies growing very fast? Right. So hopefully they've got their processes figured out. I'm thinking spe specifically about the Sun Belts and the Uniteds and the onboarding of so many locations. Right. Yeah. They're, they're on merger mania right now. That's right. Yep. Um, also, I will tell you. Acquisition mania, I should say, not merger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is a big one. This is, if not the most important reason, probably up there in the top three. Um, you'll attract and keep better talent. There's no question in my mind that, um, you know, the people inside of our peer group network that complain about the workforce and the lack thereof of quality workforce options um, are also those that don't necessarily have a really powerful um, lightning rod uh, to, a, to have people, um, you know, pull to them. Like, like want to be part of an organization, have more systems in place, that kind of thing. So I think that's a key, that's a key piece. Um, also, you'll engage everyone in a culture of excellence. So number two, number three kind of come together. Um, I, you know, you see it when you see a company that's got great systems. Um, you'll see that uh, there tends to be a better, a, a more positive culture involved, not as many um, struggles. 
this is assuming that you're working on the right processes and making a difference for your customers. So if they're getting things better, faster, um, or cheaper, they're probably going to be happier than they were. Um, and so that's something that uh, you look for. In our case, inside of peer groups right now, um, Charlie's been charged with the peer group experience. So if you're a member, you know you have an experience from being onboarded all the way through exiting and becoming an alumni. Um, and so we want to te pressure test all that process along the way and see if we're doing it as best as we can. Oh, I'm dying. I should probably put some uh, whiskey in this. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um, number five, uh, you'll have more time. I think that one goes without saying. Um, there's no question the John Wooden quote is, you know, you when you have time to redo something, right? You got to take the time, get it done right up front, and then uh, you won't have to redo it again and again and again. So you'll have, you should technically have more time. Um, you'll get better at resolving issues. Probably true because you'll figure out how to innovate. Um, you'll make more money. That that the assumption would be that more work is being done at a, a more efficiently, and therefore uh, you're able to process more and and generate more revenue. So, company becomes more valuable if you're making more money, right? So that's a great example of one begetting the other. And then lastly, if your company's more valuable, you'll live a better life, right? <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> so obviously that, you know, the idea on the first third of the book is to really focus you on um, getting, doing it, right? Making it happen. So I think those are great takeaways. <clears throat> I don't know, Ruben, how far you got in the book. Did you get well, to the second part? No, no, this is a... Um... But the in and out where I stop. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you were right there then. So you got through the, the first part of the meeting pretty much, uh, which is great. So cost of a week of process. This is not as long, but um, you'll struggle to find and keep great people. Um, there's no question that processes that have not worked out have caused the end of relationships, right? Which means that people have left companies. And so that's something that you want to uh, nip in the bud, and you never want to have somebody leave your company because they didn't like uh, how things were done, right? <coughs> Any comments on that one? Think about your great people. Anybody ever lose somebody and you wish you didn't lose them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that mm -hmm. sucks. Um, also, your business will stop growing, which all that other stuff we covered, if your business is growing, um, all that stuff starts to to go away. So um, growth is a good thing. Um, certainly, you can still perform well as a company without the growth. Um, usually, you only want that to be temporary. Um, for anybody who sat through Profit First, <coughs> we give you a formula for making more money without growing. And uh, there's no question that companies that adhere to profit first will increase their bottom line. And again, part of it is systemic. So you're focusing on the processes around recognition of revenue. It's how it all starts with profit first. So um, also, uh, this one's big. Your business may fall behind or become obsolete. So I can tell you that in the market that I live in, which is Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, um, it was a hotbed for about maybe slow, slowed down about three years ago, but for 10 years up to three years ago, it was crazy. Everyone was coming into the market. So you had people coming in from New York, from the mid middle, middle of the state, and then also from the Philadelphia market. And so you just were competing against everybody. <laughs> I would actually say that event rental in Atlanta in the surrounding Atlanta region is has faced similar growth, right? When you say Ruben, oh, yeah. it's amazing what's happened down there. Um, and if you're not moving forward, you're definitely <laughs> losing ground. Um, luckily, we only have a couple of uh, members who are falling behind significantly. We do have some people that are dropping 10 to 20% a year. And so we're at a 
process of, you know, where are we headed with this? Are we going to invest our way out of it? Are we going to sell the business? And we have a lot of people exiting, you know, 10 to 15% exiting. Um, but it, it's tough. You got to make some hard decisions. But part of it is just doing the right things with your time when you wake up in the morning, right? And go to work. So <clears throat> a couple stories um, that are outlined in this particular <clears throat> chapter, really, um, there's a guy who owns, he's a founder of Capriati's. Um, his story was about key employees and how uh, having a good process kept the good employees, but having a weak process lost some employees. Um, and FBC remodeling was a story <coughs> where um, they had three locations and the Virginia location did not have their processes as tight as the other two. And it ended, ended up going out of business. And he could not save all those employee positions that he would have preferred to save. So that was an issue. Um, the last story that they put in this section was Uber versus taxi system. So goes into detail on the history of the taxi system and how it got to where it was and then how they got their lunch eaten by Uber, um, which could have been avoided, right? So they had everyone in the in the system had the ability to make a change but they just can't respond the way that Uber did due to Uber's technology. Any thoughts about that, Uber? How about what you're facing in rental? What's What feels a little bit, or you keep an eye on it, when, when it feels a little bit like an Uber situation in rental? Any examples? Anybody? I think I think just knowing what's coming for in the equipment side, what's coming forward with the technology, so things like electronic earth moving, um, you know, in the battery run lawn and garden, even for the small general stuff, you know, that once that that's known outside to yeah. the contractors, they're they're starting to look for that. So I think just staying in tune on the technology that's coming forward, even though some of us won't see a lot of it um, being small uh, for a while, but at least being conscious that it's there. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, things that have happened over the last five to 10 years with big rents and equipment, equip share. Um, you know, we've had a, a number of presenters. Quiply right now has is demoing their software inside of a number of our members' businesses. You're seeing some dynamic pricing pop up. You're seeing people who are using Rouse in a way that kind of gives them an advantage, right? Just like, you know, people who trade on the internet have faster systems in some cases, right? So <clears throat> when they're trading stocks. So I think that's something to keep an eye on and say, hmm, dynamic pricing, e-commerce. We, we had one Bobcat dealer um, who was only doing about uh, maybe 5 million in rental, equipment rental. And... Um, about, I guess it was three meetings ago, he started reporting on his e-commerce sales. And it was ridiculously small, like started at 5,000, went to 10,000, went to 30,000. So he he's committed. Like, he's like, I'm going to report this little number because this little number is going to grow and grow. And I'm eventually going to be selling a lot of rental or the people are going to rent directly online. And I'm not going to be, um, you know, have to... Uh, be as active in it, right? So um, I think that <clears throat> that's something to keep in mind um, that, you know, you always want to have a look at what are the upcoming threats and opportunities that are facing you, right? So, all right, okay. let's see where we're at here. Okay, so own it. So this is you got uh, five minutes to the top of the hour. Yeah. So this just sets us up for our next meeting. So I'm <laughs> going to take you through, this is our last slide. Um, why top performers may fight you on being part of this. So there's really um, the biggest thing is like, okay, who's the person to, to own this and become part of it. Cause in EOS, we say somebody's got to own, you can't like have everybody own it because then no one owns it. So you need somebody to do it. Um, just because you have a great performer in one area of your company doesn't mean that they're the right one to do the documentation and all the activity. <clears throat> so number one, she may not love the idea of doing it. 
Um, if her personality or behavior is a certain way, she might not want to be involved. She may not, she may struggle with the assignment, right? Um, because they might be, she might be focused on like, hey, my skill set sales, and you've got me documenting here. So there's a there's a disconnect. Um, and that's the last part is too. Her time might will might be better spent elsewhere. So you want to kind of spend the time, take the time and look at your internal um, doings of your company and say, if we're going to go down this path, you know, is everybody working their own department on this? Or do we have a specialist who gets assigned and they go through the process of putting some of the uh, pieces together um, going forward? So my one recommendation <coughs> is to look at, um, you know, culture index or disk profiling uh, Charlie sells this, so we have this available, but it really can help you identify the type of person that might be the one to help you on this process and owning it and making sure that you get somewhere. So you're looking really for a person who might be um, task focused. So it means that they would fall on the left side of this disk profile. Um, they may have some compliance um, at the same time. Uh, it, it might be active, but it's probably more reflective. So, you know, in my mind, it's it's there is a, a certain critical need to have a support person, uh, someone who is is stable and is consistent, um, and then obviously detail oriented, right? So, so that's kind of where where I focus versus like the lead salesperson or someone right. who's very active interacting with people. And um, has a tendency to act emotionally and not uh, systemically, right? So you just got to be careful about it. Um, who's going to be involved in what? So that being said, that brings us to the end of the meeting for today, the book club meeting. And uh, we're going to get back together on the 8th, if you can make it. Just real quick here, I want to jump to the slide so we can remind you. I wish I had an easier way to do this. Uh, here we go. Okay, so when we get back together next time, and this is the, uh, I'm actually halfway done the book. Um, so the second half of the book really focuses on IDP, identify, document, simple fly, and then package, and then uh, followed by all. How do you get everybody in your company doing it, right? That's this checklist, followed by all. So that's it. I appreciate everybody coming. Any last questions from anybody? Oh, good job. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Well, this has been fun and uh, looking forward to you if you can make it the next one. Uh, but at the very least, you've got this and um, we'll make sure we get you the other um, PowerPoint as well. Everybody have a good Thanksgiving. Thanks, guys. Yeah. All right. Enjoy. Thanksgiving. Enjoy your holiday. Okay. You take care, guys. See ya.